field of recovery, you not only have a variety of equipment at your disposal, but a number of recovery trailers and tank recovery transporters. Of the recovery trailers, there are two main types in general use, the lighter being the seven and a half ton cranes. It's a six wheeler with a hand winch for loading a casualty onto its platform. Here is a Bren carrier about to be loaded. The trailer has already been lined up with the casualty by its tractor, a three ton Leyland six by four breakdown. As the crew double to their work, each man knows the jobs he has to do. One applies the trailer brakes, another unshackles the Warwick strainers, while a third releases and extends both the rear jacks. Whoever applies the brakes also frees the ramps by releasing the bar securing them to the platform. With the second strainer unshackled and thrown clear of the ramps, the next thing is to remove the chocks. Then attach one of the two winch handles. All hands are needed to slide the ramps down. To position them, you simply slide them off your platform and lay the top end into these hooks. Before winching operations are begun, towing ropes are shackled to the rear towing eyes of the casualty, ready to be passed under its belly. Meanwhile, the winch cable is paid out. As one man turns the winch handle, another applies the necessary tension to the cable. Before and during winching in, the NCO examines the shackling and alignment and ensures the casualty taking a clean run up the ramps to the platform. You'll notice that the second winch handle is now being operated. By steady turning, two men are able to winch quite a heavy load onto the trailer. The trailer winch carries 50 feet of 5 8 inch diameter steel cable. It is possible to use the power winch of the tractor, so either hand or power are available to suit the job in hand. Once the casualty is well and truly up on the platform and the ramp stowed, it is firmly secured both front and rear, not only by chocks, but with Warwick strainers. The NCO is the responsible man, and he gives everything a once over before moving off. A word of advice, always recheck your strainers after the first mile when the casualty has settled down. Another hint, as it is impracticable to reverse your towed trailer, don't overshoot your turning or drive into a blind alley. You'll have a hell of a job getting out again. Another use for the crane's trailer is giving a suspended tow to a heavy wheeled casualty. This is often the case when a casualty is too heavy to suspend from a breakdown jib or gantry. Whenever called upon to give a suspended tow like this, the casualty is loaded in the normal manner and secured to the trailer by Warwick strainers. Remember to leave your casualties steering free. This enables the front wheels to follow their natural path when taking bends. That was the seven and a half ton Crane's light recovery trailer. Now let's turn to the second type, the 20 ton Dyson onto which we are going to load a D8 Caterpillar tractor. Each man will do his own jobs. First, all trailer brakes are applied by turning the trunnions situated on the near side. Meanwhile, the D8 is squared up with the trailer. The driver, if necessary, dismounts to lend a hand in unloading and positioning the ramps. These ramps, although heavy, can be quickly placed into position by four men. Never drop these ramps on the ground, otherwise you'll need a sky hook and pulley blocks to lift them up again. When both have been positioned, it is essential to maneuver the D8 into direct line with them. The NCO mounts the platform so that he can check alignment and signal to the D8 driver who from his driving seat cannot see the ramps. Always get the D8 in direct line before mounting the ramps to avoid steering when actually on them. While the Dyson trailer can be used for transporting other equipment, it is normally employed for carrying the D8 tractor.
Once the NCO is satisfied that the tractor is dead in line and safely ascending the ramps, he can jump to a position on the ground where he can still watch the operation and signal to the driver. Failure to jump down might give him flat feet for the rest of his life. Once on the platform, the D8's track brake is applied and the engine stopped. The driver is now free to lend the others a hand in stowing the ramps. When these have been stowed underneath, the tractor is secured by front and rear Warwick strainers and the trailer brakes released. The NEATS parking brake and transmission brake are still applied on the scammel so she won't run away. Before setting out on the road, the NCO should check the strainers both front and rear. Remember, these will need rechecking after the first mile on the road. As you have seen, the loading drill of both the cranes and the Dyson trailers is quite simple, providing each man knows his jobs and carries them out intelligently. It's just a matter of organization and common sense. And now from trailers to tank recovery transporters. Of these, there are three main types in general use. First, there is the 20-ton Scammel transporter. Its power is drawn from a six-cylinder Gardner diesel engine, which develops 102 brake horsepower. The transporter is a self-contained unit with an articulated semi-trailer forming a horizontal platform. You can see an example of the articulation when the tractor is turned at an angle of 90 degrees. Beneath the rear of the cab is a vertical winch carrying 600 feet of steel cable and having a maximum pull of 8 tons. These are the trailer air brake connections and the electrical junction. Then the trailer retaining bolts, one on each side. This spring-loaded turntable allows the tractor to make the 90 degrees turn you have just seen, while these buffers compensate any lateral shock between tractor and trailer. The path of your winch cable is round this bottom pulley, through rollers, round the centre pulley, and up round this top pulley. Here the cable eye is shackled to the side of the frame. When separating or splitting the unit, the platform is supported by this single hydraulic jack. This is found in a central position at the front end of your platform and is lured and extended in the normal way. These tank locating chocks are adjustable and are provided to fit the inner sides of the tank tracks when loading. The ramps are detachable and are hooked on projections and secured by strainers. To position them, after the strainers have been released, a bar is inserted first into the lower holes to lift them off the projections, then into the upper holes to lure them into position. Top end is hooked onto the projections at the rear of the trailer platform. You have now seen the main features of the 20 ton Scammel tank transporter, which can always be identified by its horizontal platform and detachable ramps. Now for the 30 ton Scammel tank recovery transporter, a vehicle that has already been thoroughly tried out and has proved its efficiency in many theatres of war. It has the same power unit and fundamentally does not differ from the 20 ton you have just seen. It does, however, have a sloping platform instead of a horizontal one and drawbridge type ramps in place of the detachable ones. In spite of its larger size, it's just as maneuverable as its smaller brother. Here it is being reversed with ease through the narrow entrance of a railway siding. The job it has been sent to tackle is quite straightforward. It has to load and carry away a general grant. The first thing to do then is to manoeuvre the transporter into direct line with the tank. We are going to show you how an efficiently trained crew in which each member knows his tasks can carry out a loading operation in less than 10 minutes. 
Here is the crew, and each man has his specified jobs from start to finish. No time is wasted in doubling to action stations. Let us watch this loading operation, bearing in mind that the process is the same on each side of the trailer. The first job is to position your skid pans, flat side to the ground as we are working on a hard surface. One is put behind each front wheel and the transporter reversed onto them. Now this has been done, you may apply the brakes on each of your rear bogies by turning these screws anti-clockwise. There are four of these screws, two on each bogey. The ramp winch handles are carried in the equipment box beneath the platform. These are placed on the ramp winches and tension is applied to the ramp winch cables. The cable guides are then taken and placed into position, forming a stanchion for the ramp winch cables and giving sufficient leverage so that one man can easily raise or lower a ramp. Next, the stay nuts are unscrewed sufficiently to enable the lower end of the stays to be removed from their clips on the chassis. Now you'll see the result. They come off the clips easily. When this has been done, the stays can be withdrawn from the ramps and placed on the ground. Then, as the ramps are lowered, the ramp struts can be removed and placed beside the stays. Now for the triangular ramp supports, which are taken off their hooks on each side of the platform and are placed into position while the ramps are being lowered. They should be placed at sufficient distance away from the rear of the trailer so that the tips of the ramps, when lowered, will rest upon their apex. Good judgment in placing these will often save a great deal of time. When the tips of the ramps reach the apex of the supports, track guides carried in the equipment box are fitted. To attach these, you simply insert their dowels into the locating holes in the ramps. Now the cable guides may be removed by lifting them off and allowing the ramp cables to rest on the ground. In racks underneath the trailer platform are carried bridge pieces and tail pieces. The bridge pieces are first removed and placed over the rear bogies. These now give a clean run from the ramps to the transporter platform. The tail pieces will complete the runway, so they're taken away from the racks and placed into position on the ends of the ramps where they are interlocked. Now you have an 18 degrees incline running from the ground to the rear of your platform. To load the ground, it is necessary to use a three to one pull. So first release the winch cable eye from the top of your platform by removing this pin. While this is being done, a Holoban yoke is shackled to the towing eyes of the tank. Towards this, the winch cable is hauled out. The yoke is now shackled up. You will note that while two members of the crew are hauling out the cable, the other two are taking all necessary equipment to the tank, including a double sheave snatch block. With sufficient cable paid out, the lower bite or loop is then placed round the lower sheave of this snatch block. The yoke and the block are now shackled together. Secure shackling is of vital importance as, like the proverbial chain, a layout is no stronger than its weakest shackle. After this, the top loop or second cable bite is placed round the lower sheave of another snatch block, which is then shackled to the apex of the platform. The center return of the cable is hauled towards the tank and its eye attached to the front end of the first snatch block. Here you can see the entire layout for the three to one pull and you can see how three returns of your winch cable run from the snatch block attached to the tank up to the top of your trailer platform. All is now ready for the winching operation. The driver returns to his cab in order to operate the winching controls. Shackling is carefully inspected by the NCO. This must always be done before winching is started.
The co-driver takes up a position from which he can be seen by the driver when relaying the NCO's instructions. Now the ready signal is given and relayed, and this is closely followed by the signal to winch in, which is conveyed to the driver who puts the order into effect. First, the slack cable is carefully wound in until the full tension is applied. Then, with slow acceleration, the tank starts rolling towards the ramps. You can see now how essential it is to have the transporter dead in line with the tank. This lesson is driven home to you once the tank starts fairly and squarely to surmount the ramps. The NCO decides to halt, and the driver immediately applies his winch brake. The NCO has observed that the tank is drawing slightly to one side of the ramps. This is something that must be rectified at once by adjusting the track guides accordingly. This done, the NCO reascends to his winching station and orders winching operations to recommence. The signal is relayed to the driver, who simultaneously releases his winch brake and starts winching. The grant continues its journey up the ramps, this time to the complete satisfaction of the NCO. When the rear of the tank is halfway up the ramps, the signal is again given to halt, this time in order to attach the ramp-raising hawsers. These hawsers are carried in the equipment box and are attached by hooking their ends to the tank and the ramps. After this, both tailpieces are detached from the ramps and placed on the ground. Then, both track ramp guides are removed and the ramp raising hawsers given the once over by the NCO before recommencing to winch in. With the winching in, you'll notice how the ramps are drawn up as the tank ascends the platform. As you've seen, each ramp raising hawser is attached by having one end hooked to the shackle on the rear towing eye of the tank and the other connected to the tubular cross member of the ramp. Owing to the weight distribution on the ground, the center of gravity, shown in this instance by a chalk mark, is to the rear of its center bogey anchorage. The tank is halted when this mark is slightly forward of the appropriate mark on the trailer platform. The next job is to cross and shackle the front strainers at the top of the platform to the Holoban yoke on the front of the tank. After the strainers have been adjusted, the driver is ordered to ease off his winch brake. The tank then rolls back until its center of gravity coincides with the appropriate mark on the trailer platform. Now to prepare for the road. Tail pieces have already been stowed. Next, the bridge pieces are removed and stowed away in the racks. Triangular ramp supports are replaced and secured on their hooks. The ramp struts are positioned and stays reinserted. Meanwhile, other members of the crew have winched in the slack cable and are taking up sufficient tension to enable the stay nut to be screwed tight. After this, tension is removed from the cable. Now the ramp raising hawsers are removed and stowed away. With the Warwick strainers provided for the purpose, the rear of the tank has now been strained down. These are finally checked over by the NCO, while other members of the crew are releasing the trailer brakes at both rear and front of the bogies. Once these jobs have been completed, the crew must waste no time in remounting the vehicle and getting away. After a general once over by the NCO, all is ready for the broad highway.
The NCO dismounts again to shepherd the loaded transporter through the narrow entrance and onto the road. The loading operation you have just seen can be accomplished in 10 minutes, but only if each member of the crew knows his various jobs. Teamwork must be the keynote throughout the entire operation. Now we'll see the 30-ton Scammell tank transporter tackle another job. This time it is to recover and load a Covenanter, which is bellied and badly bogged. For this job, it's necessary to split the transporter. That is, to remove the semi-trailer so that its tractor can be used as a normal recovery vehicle. This separation is as simple as a Hollywood divorce. In the same way as you prepare the trailer for loading, you first of all apply the brakes on your rear bogies. At the same time, the jacks are removed, after releasing the pressure, by turning and withdrawing first the retaining pin and then the bayonet pin at the top end. Now the jack is carried to its position at the side of your trailer. The other jack is being similarly positioned on the far side. To provide a firm base for the jack, a gun plank is taken from the rack and placed upon the ground immediately below the jack sockets. Upon this plank is placed the jack. The valve is closed and the jack pumped up until its pinhole corresponds to those of the trailer sockets. While this is being done on each side of the trailer, the application of the brakes is being continued. The jack is finally positioned and the bayonet pin inserted and locked by turning. The two members of the crew on the other side are also completing the preparation of the jacks and the application of the brakes. The next step is for the driver to mount his cab in order to winch in the slack cable preparatory to unthreading it from the semi-trailer. Tension is applied and the cable is winched in until there is about three feet of it left at the top guide pulley. When this limit is reached, the order to halt is given. Now the cable eye is removed from the side of the frame by withdrawing the bayonet pin. Meanwhile, other members of the crew start disconnecting the air pipeline by unscrewing this hexagon nut. The electric light lead is disconnected and a second point on the airline is severed. By the way, don't forget to fit the blanking nut to the air union on the container bridge. After this, the airline bracket is unbolted and lifted from the trailer. Now back to the winch cable. On the center pulley, a retaining pin is removed and the cable eye passed down and round. Beneath the platform, a retaining pin is removed from the lower pulley and the cable is passed down until the whole of it is clear of the trailer. The cable is then winched in until the eye can be passed out through the rear rollers. When this has been done, it is ready for straightforward winching. Now the jacks are raised preparatory to removing the two retaining pins which secure the trailer to the tractor turntable. These pins are removed with the aid of an extractor after first removing the securing bolt. The remainder is quite a simple procedure by screwing in and locking the extractor bolt, then putting over it an extractor sleeve. A washer is now placed over the bolt and the extractor nut screwed on. Continue screwing this nut until the retaining pin is finally withdrawn. Orders are now given by the NCO to continue extending the jacks. This elevates the platform. 
Both of these jacks must be extended simultaneously to avoid twisting strain on the trailer chassis. The platform is raised until its draft lugs are lifted clear of the turntable. Now the tractor is free to move off as soon as the driver receives the signal from the NCO. On the trailer, the jack valves are opened and the platform lowered. These jacks must not be left under pressure while you are away working on the recovery job. After the required recovery equipment has been transferred from the trailer, the tractor proceeds to the casualty where you will see it doing a normal winching recovery. The NCO has calculated that a 4 to 1 pull is required. Here it is, laid down and the winching already in operation. You'll notice that the towing hawser is connected to the front towing eyes of the casualty. Because of the unfavorable ground conditions, it is impracticable to pass the towing hawser under the belly of the casualty and attach it to the rear towing eyes. When the casualty has been recovered and all equipment stowed, the tractor can be reconnected to the trailer and the casualty loaded. You'll again notice the use of the ramp raising hawsers. So, strained down in the normal manner by Warwick strainers, we are soon on the road. Including sharp bends, there are few places this vehicle cannot negotiate. A transporter should always be accompanied by a motorcyclist to reconnoitre the route ahead. The Scammell 30-ton tank transporter is a steady and dependable vehicle and its correct handling a vital job in all armoured formations. Another grand transporter is the 40-ton Cranes Tank Transporter Mark II. It's a combination of the Diamond T 6x4 tractor and the 40-ton, 24-wheeled Cranes Mark II trailer. In spite of its size, the loading drill is simple and straightforward, as you'll see. A Churchill with partially locked tracks is about to be loaded, so first the trailer must be aligned with the tank. As it's impracticable to reverse the transporter when connected in the normal manner, the trailer is nosed into line. This method makes for ease of manoeuvre. Its drawbar, you will see, is connected to the front towing attachment, while the brake pipelines are attached to the front air connections of the tractor. By the way, the trailer has no outer guide rails and the inner guide rails are adjustable. Once it's squared up with the job, the tractor's turned round and reconnected. Now for the laying of skid pans. These are placed so that the spades will dig into the soft ground when the tractor is reversed onto them in the usual way. All trailer brakes are now applied by turning the two trunnion wheels. The offside trunnion applies the front brakes and the near side the rear. The next operation is to position the hinged triangular ramps. To release them, you first unscrew the securing attachment. They are then swung down on their pivots, not forgetting to place the distance pieces provided between the ramp steps and the platform tail. All the tackle for a five to one pull is now unloaded. The necessary shackles and skidding and two double sheave snatch blocks. The tank towing hawsers needed will be found in the casualty. Incidentally, the Diamond team must carry seven to 14 tons of ballast in order to obtain sufficient tractive effort. Here's the layout of tackle for a five to one pull. The winch rope or cable passes from the rear of the tractor over the roller. This double sheave snatch block is attached to the trailer and carries four returns of the cable. Then there are five returns running down to the second snatch block under the belly of the tank, which is connected to two of the rear towing eyes. With your casualty in dead line with the ramps, no difficulty should be experienced when loading. The winching operation is conducted in the normal manner. To load this Churchill with partially locked tracks means applying approximately twice the pull required to load one with free tracks. The fact that this can be accomplished is a striking tribute to the strength and sturdy construction of the transporter. With the casualty safely on board and after the loading tackle has been disconnected and stowed, the casualty is strained down, a single strainer on the front and crossed Warwick strainers at the rear. 
Never allow the threaded portions of your strainers to foul. Once again, remember to recheck your straining after the first mile on the road. Another 40 ton transporter you may use for recovery is the Diamond T Drawn Rogers trailer. This differs very slightly from the cranes and when on the job is operated in a similar manner. The main tank recovery transporters to remember, therefore, are the 20 ton Scammel with its horizontal platform and detachable ramps. The 30 ton Scammel with its inclined platform and drawbridge ramps. The Diamond T Drawn Cranes 40 ton Mark II trailer. Whether through country, desert or town, all these vehicles are designed to play an important part. There are, of course, others like the... Oh, well, this is still on the secret list. <laughs>